them to our Reproducibility for Everyone workshop uh, for all of you guys at Tufts. Um, thanks to uh, Claire Moore for, you know, setting this up. And as we heard, one of her students actually um, helped to bring this to you guys as well. So thanks to that anonymous person. <laughs> um, you'll see some links that uh, in the uh, chat um, that you can uh, go to and take a look around. The handout is just a reference. The notes document is going to be a collaborative note taking and question and answer space. Um, and then the slide deck is there for you guys to um, follow along and to use uh, yourself if you want. Um, so my name's April um, and I've been doing these workshops, um, different versions of them now for like a few years alongside a lot of other reproducibility for everyone volunteers. And if you find this interesting, if you wanna get involved, uh, please reach out. We're always happy to have more people, you know, contribute to this work and to run some of these uh, yourself. So uh, welcome. We're really excited to be here. Uh, I just want to also thank our sponsors. We um, recently received um, a grant from Chan Zuckerberg Initiative and have been also supported by AdGene and eLife, um, as well as protocols, uh, amongst some other um, great sponsors in the past. And I just wanted to also send out a big thank you to Benjamin. Um, a lot of the work here, Benjamin Schwesinger is a, a researcher in Australia and a lot of the slides you'll see here, a lot of the work organizing this community is thanks to him. So he always is gonna get a slide on this slide deck. Uh, so as I mentioned, there is a shared notes document, and this is a place, uh, if you go into the uh, shared notes, this link down here um, right now and take a look at it, uh, it's, it's a collaborative editing place. You can remain anonymous on it if you like, or you can name yourself. Um, and it's a great place for you to add your thoughts about what we're talking about as we go along as well as your questions as we go along. And then we can always revisit those and um, answer them there. And the benefit of doing it in this way is that you can actually answer each other's questions as well. And we find the best workshops that we do are ones where people will actually share their knowledge um, in this uh, uh, shared notes document. Um, so it's not just the two of us that are, you know, bringing information about how to make your science more reproducible. A lot of you already know some of this stuff yourself, whether you've thought of it in terms of reproducibility or not. Um, and you can use plus one for comments and questions that you think are important. So let's take a minute to just try that out. If everyone goes into that shared notes document, I put in a question, how is everyone today? Put a plus one next to the emoji that most <laughs> represents how you're feeling on this Friday. And um, you can add a mo an emoji that's missing if you want. All right, we see a lot of happy people. So this is great. And for those of you that are less happy, hopefully we will, you know, teach you something and improve, you know, how you feel by the end of the day. We'll see. That's great. All right. So um, we like to start these workshops by reflecting a little bit about why we should care about reproducibility. Why does it matter to you? And there are certainly a lot of uh, ways of framing reproducibility as an issue, um, but we like to focus on um, the personal and think about um, in which ways reproducibility uh, and lack of reproducibility can impact your work, as well as the ways in which reproducibility can benefit your work. So um, we like to focus on our own experiences. And that's why we sent out that survey, which many of you filled out in advance of this workshop. Um, and that's because um, when we think about reproducibility as a high level issue, I think it can become uh, overwhelming. It feels like bigger than us. But honestly, this is something that we've all experienced. Um, you can see from uh, your responses to this survey that uh, a great number of you have had problems reproducing your own work. And this happens a few weeks, you know, months or sometimes years down the line when you come back to your research and you try and rerun some code or you try and figure out what it is that you did so that you can build upon some particular, um, you know, method that you used in the past. And for some reason, you can't get it to work. 
So that is uh, very common. Um, it's also very common to come into a lab for the first time and inherit some methods from some other people in that lab and have a hard time getting them to work for yourself the same way that the, your predecessor did. Um, so uh, it's very common for people to um, have either one or the other of these experiences when they're dealing with real life research. So these are the problems that we want to focus on. Um, there are a lot of things that we need to do as a community of scientists and researchers to tackle issues in reproducibility, but we're going to talk about the things that can help these specific problems. The problem of you um, remembering what you did well enough so that you can redo it, and the problem of joining someone else's research project or trying to reuse someone else's published paper and their methods in order to build upon it. So this is uh, how we like to frame the problem of reproducibility. So our goals and objectives for the workshop is to give you a framework, a conceptual framework around reproducibility, just an introductory sort of way in to thinking about these problems. Um, but we're gonna dive into the practical stuff pretty quickly. We're gonna talk about the tools and the methods that can actually make it easier for you to rerun your own work or for other people to rerun your work. Um, and we view this as an introductory first step. So sort of an introduction to the ecosystem. Um, you know, none of these things are things that you can just adopt overnight. It's sort of the beginning of a lifelong journey um, for all of us as researchers and scientists to try and do a little bit better with each new project. So we're gonna talk about what reproducibility means. What are the different modes? Um, we're going to talk about how reproducibility fits into some of the art larger things we need to think about as scientists, including rigor and uh, logic and um, these sorts of uh, issues. And then we're going to go through a reproducibility tool shed, uh, focusing on what we call the four facets of reproducibility, which is organization, documentation, automated analysis, and dissemination. So you'll see these little tabs at the top of each of the slides will give you a sort of signal into which of these facets the different things we're gonna talk about fall into. So let's start with the basics. What does reproducibility mean? Um, and as someone who's been teaching about reproducibility for many years, this is actually a very difficult question to answer because it does depend on the discipline. And there aren't really agreed upon, you know, meanings of reproducibility from one discipline to the other. So what we like to do when we're talking about reproducibility in our community is just sort of state some um, definitions from the beginning of any conversation, and that will allow you to be on the same page with the person you're talking about and allow you to have a productive conversation. Um, but two very common uh, uh, definitions of reproducible research are these two, which is reproducible research, meaning that authors provide all the necessary information, such as the data and the code and the methods in order for somebody else to run the analysis again and to get the same results. So you're not rerunning an entire study when people talk about reproducible research, you're just rerunning the data and the code and you're trying to get the same tables, the same numbers and the same figures as the original author. And then a higher level um, uh, uh, goal is replication. So replication is when you're actually rerunning an entire study um, over again. So you need to have all the information available. So it does need to be reproducible, um, but you're also collecting new data. So you're running a whole new study, you're getting new data, and you're running a whole new analysis. So you may be using the exact same code, you might be adapting it, you might be using, um, you know, a different analysis. So this is sort of the gold standard that we're aiming for is uh, the ability to actually replicate each other's study. So um, how does, do these ideas of reproducibility relate to other related ideas, such as generalizability, robustness, these sorts of words that we get uh, that are thrown around so often. Um, this chart from the Turing Way, which is a really great resource for people starting to think about reproducibility, um, is really helpful to think about how these concepts are related. So if you're using the same methods and the same data, so the the uh, um, example we gave before, which is the same code and the same data, um, and you're able to get the same results, that's uh, termed reproducibility. 
if you actually can get the same results, even though you're using some different methods, so you're using maybe a different analysis tool, maybe you're using a slightly different statistical test or approach, that is robustness. So it's reproducible and it's robust to tiny changes in the methods. If you go out and you gather new data, so you're actually rerunning another study or another experiment um, with the same methods, then what you have is replication or replicability of a study. And then finally, what we all are hoping to be able to achieve is something that is not only able to be replicated as a study and get the same answers, but actually be able to um, you know, uh, have those answers be generalizable to different populations, to slightly different analysis methods. And that's sort of where um, you know, you're, you've come up with something that uh, is really easily reused and really is making a big contribution to research. So just want to uh, point out to you all that you can still ask your questions either in the chat or in the shared notes document at any time. Um, if, if anything occurs to you, like you have a good example of this or you have, you know, sort of uh, an experience of this, also feel free to share that in the shared notes document or in the chat. Um, so is reproducibility all that matters? So I think probably from the framing of that question, you probably know the answer. Reproducibility is just one of the things that we need to think about as scientists in terms of like how we should be trying to improve um, our science, improve our methods, and um, do a little better every time. Um, but it's important to keep in mind as we start to learn, you know, start this journey of learning about how to improve and accelerate science is that um, it's a learning process and it's a moving target. Um, we learn more about the best ways to do our science all the time. Methods evolve over time um, and no one is perfect. So think about this as an incremental thing you can do. Every time you start a new project, you can make one change to make it a little bit more reproducible, to make it a little bit more transparent, um, and you're on the right path towards um, improving and accelerating your work. So what are some of the factors decreasing reproducibility? Uh, for those of you that filled out the survey, you gave some really great answers and we'll get to those in just a minute, but you can break them down into these four buckets, technical issues, human issues, study design and statistics, as well as higher level issues in the way that we reward each other for uh, certain types of work and the incentives that we have as researchers and scientists. So there are um, a lot of things here and there's um, not enough time in this particular uh, workshop to go over all of them. Some of these are maybe familiar to you and some of them might be new to you. But uh, the, the message is that there are a lot of factors that contribute to this. It's a complex um, situation. Um, you know, issues with reproducibility arise out of all of these little decisions and environments that um, come into, uh, uh, you know, designing and working through a research project as well as reporting it, how it's shared, how uh, we pay for it, how we reward it. Um, so uh, the, the theme that I'm trying to pull through of this is that it's a complicated and complex um, problem, but we want to think about it not in terms of it being a crisis that's overwhelming and difficult, but instead think of this as an opportunity for us to do better um, as a community and as, as individuals over time. So this is a great uh, quote from Carrie Bargman, who is um, a, the president of uh, CZI Science. Um, and she commented that, you know, 82 years ago, there were no antibiotics. And we didn't know that smoking causes cancer. How do we learn that? We learned that through science. So science works. We just need to learn a little bit about how to do it better with the new methods we have, with the new information we have, with the new understanding that we have. So we can expect to do a lot more in the future. So when you think about adopting some of these, you know, methods into your own research, um, think about it as a way of, you know, uh, taking advantage of where we are in this current phase in scientific research and how we can use these tools and methods to accelerate 
the great work that we're already doing. So think of it as an opportunity, think of it as a benefit. Don't think of it as a crisis and a negative thing. Um, so finally, here are your great ideas for what we can do to uh, improve reproducibility. And a lot of these we're gonna talk about in the workshop. Um, so better methods, more data, more power, so larger studies, um, less pressure to publish, fewer incentives to be first rather than right, sharing reagents and code, um, sharing all of your information about your statistical packages. Um, we're gonna talk about that. And then two great suggestions from you guys was um, incentives to actually go ahead and reproduce each other's work and for labs to reproduce each other's work. So everyone starts somewhere, every little bit helps and no one is perfect. So hopefully some thing that we're gonna cover today, we're focusing on practical things will be useful for you. And just trying it out one time in one new project nudges you along um, to uh, accelerating your work. So uh, many of these things will benefit yourself because it'll make it easier for you to um, you know, do your work more efficiently as well as helping you onboard other people to your work and sharing your work so that they can understand it. Great. Okay. All right, Nela. Um, my turn. <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, my name is Nela. Um, I'm a postdoctoral fellow at Baylor College of Medicine in Houston um, and I study bone biology. Um, and I learned about um, this workshop and this initiative just a little over a year ago when I, I saw it hosted somewhere um, and I, I participated myself in the event and I just you know learned so many things and had so many moments where I thought oh this could actually really help um, so I started I started to reach out and try to get involved and it's it's been a, a great experience so far and I'm still learning every time that I uh, I get to host these workshops with other people so I think one of the one of the messages that April already um, uh, tried to convey earlier that I want to really emphasize is if, you, if you're interested, just reach out to us. We're always um, looking for more people to help us spread this message because we think it really helps you and everybody else in science. And we would love to hear from you if, uh, if you have the same experience. Um, so I'm going to start a section on uh, data management. Um, and for me personally, this is the section that has had the biggest impact on my daily life um, in the lab, um, because I am definitely one of the people, um, April, if you want to go to the next slide, um, who is extremely familiar with these kind of feelings where I know I've done something, I have saved it in a folder somewhere, I've given it a name, but I just can't remember what it was called or where I saved it. Um, and so some of the tips that we're going to share with you in, in the next 10 minutes or so are going to try to help you uh, tackle this problem so that you don't have to go back and redo your analysis just because you can't find your file anymore. Um, if you want to go to the next slide, please. So um, the key message that, that will come out from here is that it, it really pays off to do some of the legwork upfront and to think about what kind of data you're going to get um, uh, from a project and how you could best structure that. So if you, if you come up with a plan on beforehand, it can help you be happy in the long run. Next slide, please. So some of the things that you, you want to think about before you actually start out is what kind of data you will, will be um, generating as part of your project, how you're going to try to organize and, and store um, all of these different kinds of uh, data, um, who is actually going to take the responsibility of carrying out the activities that you've been uh, listing above, and um, when are you going to do all of these projects, when are you going to be gathering different kinds of data, or, or what's your timeline? Um, and then you also want to think about any kind of metadata that you might want to um, um, produce over time. Um, next slide, please. I think it's really important to, to um, emphasize what April mentioned before, that some of these things take time to develop. Um, and just to kind of share a personal message, I told you I started just over a year ago with this project or with, with uh, being involved with reproducibility. Um, and I, I work on, let's say, three or four different projects. I've managed to 
change one of my folders for one of the projects that I've, I've started in the past. And I mean, my life is so much easier for this project, whereas if I have to um, find some data that I generated for a different project, it usually takes me a bit longer. So don't think you have to incorporate everything all at once. Just think about um, some of the tips that we're going to give you. Would you like to try them out? If, you, if you're starting a new experiment or starting a new kind of project, um, just try it out, build out your structure and, and see if it works for you. Next slide, please. So what you, what you may want to start with is to think about your directory structure up front. Like I mentioned, if you have different projects, make different folders for every individual project and make subfolders within there that will talk about the different types of data that you'll have. So you're, you're going to have a folder for your methods, for your raw data, your analysis, any kind of scripts that you may have, um, the manuscript that hopefully you will be able to write up about this project at some point, and then any kind of readme file and or an electronic lab notebook link that you might have. Um, Personally, I have found adding readme files extremely useful, um, whether it's for yourself in the future to, to go back and think, oh, what was it again that I was doing here? Um, or if you're passing on this project because you're leaving the lab and you're passing it on to a next member for them to be able to catch up on what exactly it was that you did. So it, it's very helpful to really develop an informative directory structure on beforehand. Um, so that all of the materials that are being generated on a specific project stay together. Next slide, please. Um, so once you have these files and you have these folders set up, then you can start to populate them with specific content that, con content, sorry, that will fit into um, any of these folders. So now, now you start to, for instance, put your different analyses that you did um, in different years in the folders for the analysis. You start to put your raw data in, in the file there. Um, and like I mentioned, um, whenever, for me personally, whenever I'm doing a kind of analysis, I tend to, I, most of mine I'm doing in Excel, and I tend to add a separate tab sheet at, on front um, where I just write down what exactly it was that I did, what was the project, how did I treat my mice, how have they been collected, just so that everything stays together and it's easy for someone who takes over the project to, to take over or so to catch up on everything that was done. Uh, next slide, please. Um, Something to really emphasize is to never throw away your raw data and make sure that it's backed up in different ways. Um, for instance, at the institute where I'm working at now, we are storing all of our data on Box, but we were just told, hey, you know what? Next year, Box will be gone. We're transferring to a different, um, a different storage method. So if you're not if you're not careful in how you are storing your data, you might find yourself, you know, they're transferring all of your data, something went wrong, everything is gone. Um, you don't want to find yourself in that situation because a lot of effort and a lot of time and resources will go wasted that way. So you really want to make sure that you back up your data in different locations, um, optimally um, with, with an, a synchronized backup. Next slide, please. Um, so once, once you have all your folders set up, now you, you have to start thinking about how you're going to name the files that you're going to save. And this is another big problem where sometimes you can, you can find yourself in a situation where you, you really think that you've generated your final version, you're done with it, you don't want to look at it again, but then someone else comes back with some, some edits and you're going to have to change it again. So you go to the second final version and you know, like it, it can build up. Um, so it can get confusing to find the right file um, at, at a time later um, in time. So it helps to set up some kind of general rules for yourself. Next slide, please. Here, um, it's important to um, remember or to keep in mind that there is no general set of rules that's going to work for everyone. What matters is that you, you have some rules that you stay consistent with. Um, and, and it doesn't really matter what kind of rules you follow, for sure the person who works next to you in the lab will have their own set of rules that might be quite different from how you are doing it. Um, but it does help if, if you do follow the same set of rules throughout your different projects. 
So you could include, I, I mean, this to me is, is one that you should to include the dates when, when your uh, file was, was uh, generated. Um, you can use meaningful abbreviations. Um, it's, this word is here for a reason, meaningful. Don't just use some kind of abbreviation that no one else will be able to figure out. Um, you can have group identifiers. Um, similar to the README file earlier, it helps to document your decisions. So to write down somewhere, you know, this is how, how my file namings are, are, or how I've generated my file names and how I work with them. Um, that helps not only for yourself later on, but also for, for people who might take over the project. And then to add uh, version numbers uh, so that you can go back and say, okay, version number six is clearly the last one that I did. So this must be the one that I want to look at. Next slide, please. And so here it's it's kind of up to you how specific you want to make your, your um, file names. Um, you can see that um, in the example here, if you would be as specific as possible, your file name becomes quite long. So, um, whether that works for you or not, you have to you have to experiment with a little bit. Um, uh, for me, I don't I don't specifically add the project into my file names, but I do add the experiment and the type um, and the version for sure, as well as the date. Uh, but I don't add the ID or the project itself. So you have to you have to play around with it a little bit. You know, next week or next month when you when you start a new sub project or a new experiment or you're starting to play with with a new method, for instance, try it out. Uh, think about what kind of data you're going to generate um, and play around with file namings as well as with your directory. And I think you'll find um, really big benefits from there. Next slide, please. Awesome, thanks, Nela. Um, we've got some great questions in the shared notes file right now. I gave a first um, uh, attempt at answering some of them, but we'll make sure everything's answered by the end of uh, our uh, workshop today. So related to this focus on the importance of organization um, and documentation of the types of um, materials and files that we create, um, a great tool to think about bringing into your workflow to help you achieve some organization and some documentation are electronic notebooks. So if any of you are using an electronic notebook right now, it's really helpful to share in the shared notes doc, you know, your experience, what worked for you, what didn't work for you, because it can be an overwhelming um, thing to think through in terms of which one to get started with if you're thinking about trying it out. Uh, so lab notebooks have been around and been essential to science for uh, a very long time. So this is an example of a notebook from Leonardo da Vinci. Um, and uh, this is obviously um, a little bit fancier than the notebooks that I used to make in my lab, but it is important to be um, recording the work that you're doing as you're doing it, because it's easy to think you'll remember it and you'll remember the details, but um, as our lives get busy and time passes, uh, we will find that we will forget important details about what we did. Um, so uh, keep track of the work you're doing. Um, and if you're using a paper notebook, uh, think about whether or not it might make it easier for you if you are able to search through those materials that you're uh, writing down in your research, um, whether or not you have a way to um, back up those materials in case there's a fire or in case something happens to your lab notebook. <clears throat> um, and whether or not there is an easy way for you to share and collaborate on that work when it is being documented in just the um, hard copy version. Um, so some ways to think through uh, whether or not an electronic lab notebook might work for you um, is to think about whether or not you will benefit from searching um, through your notes more easily, whether or not being able to embed um, the work that you're doing in other platforms, um, such as websites or emails um, or other sort of collaborative tools, um, whether that would benefit the work you do, um, whether or not exporting is something that can help you uh, to back up your work, because it can uh, definitely help you to keep sort of uh, some redundant places to save the important work that you're doing. Um, whether or not it's uh, possible to control the access that uh, people have to your work. So can you easily share it? Can you control permissions 
Some people can change things. Some people can only view things. It's a lot harder to do with a paper notebook. Um, and some of these electronic lab notebooks can be used on um, mobile devices as well. So that's useful in the lab for taking photos of things. So there's other ways of documenting the work you're doing that are easier to do with an electronic lab notebook than with a paper notebook. Um, so for those that aren't familiar with an electronic lab notebook, here's just one example. They all look a little bit different, but on the uh, left side, you can see what Nayla was talking about, the ability to um, organize and structure your work in this, uh, in this way within this notebook. Um, it allows you to uh, have these different areas of your uh, notebook be shared with other collaborators as well as supervisors, uh, for example, so they can really easily see what you're up to. Um, you can uh, uh, attach different things, such as this particular um, uh, image here can be put directly within the notebook. You can take photos with your uh, phone and you can add those into the notebook. Um, you can uh, embed these things into other reports that you wanna share with people. Um, and uh, make it easier to troubleshoot things because people can look directly at, you know, your finding if you're if you need to, um, you know, work through a problem with somebody uh, that's not physically in your lab at that moment. Um, you can search through uh, all of these different uh, materials that you have organized here, which um, especially if you've adopted one of these great file naming conventions that Naila mentioned, you would be able to really easily search through you know, by the um, study, for example, by the individual that did it, by the um, date. Um, many of these electronic lab notebooks allow you to sort um, your materials through a, a variety of variables that they capture automatically. Um, printing, sharing, um, and a really useful one is automatic dating of everything, um, as well as uh, versions. So if you have something that you're updating all, over time, you can see that this version was on this date and then you made some changes to that file and then um, it will actually show the evolution of your work over time. Um, so uh, some of you might be able to tap into institutional uh, licensing for some uh, electronic lab notebooks. Some of you won't and then cost con uh, considerations are important. So there are some that you have to pay for in terms of licensing. Some have a free version where you might hit a ceiling at some point where you'll no longer be able to do certain things for free. Some are open source, um, such as open uh, wetware, and many of those are free as well. Um, the open science framework is, uh, can be used as an electronic lab notebook, um, and it's completely free and open source. Um, some people just create a wiki um, so this is just the same sort of thing as Wikipedia, place of organizing files and text. Um, so it doesn't have to be complicated. Um, it can be difficult to make these decisions though, because one size does not fit all. It really depends on what matters to you in your lab and the types of data that you're working with. So uh, there's this really great uh, um, spreadsheet that Harvard actually keeps up to date uh, that will compare all of these different lab notebooks in one spreadsheet, um, in turn, including like how interactive they are. How are things stored? Are they stored locally? Are they stored in the cloud? Um, how expensive are they? You know, uh, these sorts of things are really important. When you are uh, choosing a free one, um, you want to make sure that you understand exactly, you know, what are the terms and conditions? How long are they going to keep your data for? Things like that. So this spreadsheet is really helpful if you're thinking about starting with an electronic lab notebook to figure out where's a good place to start. And another good place to start is to see what your colleagues in a similar field are already using, because sometimes that can give you a shortcut and you can learn from their mistakes of adopting a tool that didn't fit with your workflow and, and you can sometimes actually collaborate um, easily by using the same tool. Um, so just to keep uh, you know, a few tips in mind, um, always make sure you're backing up your data regularly. So if you have you know, an electronic lab notebook, make sure that data doesn't exist only in one place, either keep it in the cloud and 
locally and on a hard drive, or maybe a hard copy and locally and on the cloud. Maybe you have a server at your institution where you can back things up. Um, if you are taking physical observations, keep those in a notebook in parallel. Uh, and um, using the apps can really uh, help, as I mentioned before. And if you're using a free one, check about the data ownership policies. Make sure you're not giving up any of your rights to your data, that you won't lose access to your data, and that you have your privacy pr uh, protected. Um, so those are some things to keep in mind when you're trying out an electronic lab notebook for the first time. Back to you, Nayla. I'm ready. <laughs> um, if you can go to the next slide, please. The next section that we're going to talk about is how to organize and share your protocols. And this is another really important and a big one. Um, um, if you want to go to the next slide, um, mostly because um, you will find yourself that it can save you really a lot of time if you're able to find protocols that have been really optimized and fine tuned for the specific organism or tissue that you are working on. Um, just to give you, you an example of when I transitioned from uh, grad school into my postdoc, I was working on um, uh, muscle development in fruit flies uh, for my PhD, and I was going to start characterizing the muscle in mice uh, for my postdoc. And I thought, you know, I, I already know uh, some of the basics, so I should, it should not be all too hard of a transition. But it took me really about a, uh, about a year to to optimize my histology for, um, for muscle within the mouse because our lab was not a muscle lab and they had no idea of how you actually had to do that. And I couldn't really figure it out based on just the protocols that I could find in the papers. Um, so it's hard if you have to reinvent the wheel knowing that a lot of people are doing this in different labs. Um, so what we want to share with you here in the next section are some tips on how you can try to avoid that. Next slide, please. So I just wanted to, oh, okay, well, <laughs> I wanted to ask you guys to, to share in the chat, in the chat or in the, in the um, note um, how, you, how you were, uh, well, it's okay, April, <laughs> you can leave it there, um, where you would find your protocols. Um, and I, I tried to come up with some of the, the places where you would go. Um, you, you might want to ask, I mean, the most, the most common spot would be to ask your fellow lab member, have you done this before? How do you do this? Can you please share your protocol with me? Um, if it's a, um, a method that your lab is not familiar with, you may want to go look for the literature to, to um, search for protocols that have been described there. Um, you can look at ResearchGate, uh, ask your question there, how do people um, do this specific type of experiment? Um, you can contact the author of a paper that describes what you want to do. You can try to create them yourself, but I can tell you it will take some time. Uh, and what we'll talk about here is to, um, to look for repositories and to make sure that you deposit your own protocols there. Next slide, please. Um, um, one of the... Okay. Um, um, as you are starting with a new method, often you will first go look in the literature to see if you can find that uh, method described um, in some of the previous papers that you've been reading. And so it can be really frustrating to find exactly that paper that does just what you want to do. And you go to the method section to try to find out how they exactly did it, and they refer you to another paper. You go to that paper, they refer you to another paper. You find that paper, it refers you to yet a different one, and then you hit a paywall. You just can't access that paper. Um, so then you have to try it a different way. Uh, next slide, please. You try that different way. You find a different paper that describes the same protocol um, or that describes the same method that you want to, to try. Um, and they again refer you to another paper. And when you finally find that original paper, the description is ambiguous and they just tell you that you know they did it according to conventional methods, which really does not tell you much. Next slide, please. Because, I mean, I don't know about you, but I for sure don't know what conventional methods are. <laughs> Um, and this is kind of analogous of this story um, that tries to explain to you um, in a step-by-step -step method how you can draw this beautiful owl that you can see in step two. So you can see that there's really, um, in the second paragraph there, there's a lot of detail on how you draw on the specific kind of paper with a specific pencil, these beautiful circles in step one, and then ta-da, you just end up at 
um, a beautiful owl in step two. There's a lot of stuff that's missing here that is really essential for you to be able to actually draw the owl without, um, you know, just trying it yourself. Next slide, please. So the solution to, to many of these problems is to use repositories for your protocols and don't just try to cram your, your detailed method that you've spent your whole PhD or postdoc on um, uh, optimizing into the four lines that you get in your supplemental file to describe your method. Um, so repositories are places where you can deposit your, um, your uh, protocol with all of the details that are necessary for someone else to be able to replicate them or be able to um, perform the experiment themselves. Um, just to show you that this is a pretty common problem that, that people are trying to work on now um, is a story that was published in The Scientist um, where um, they're trying to really emphasize how difficult it can be to find the right method if all of it has to be described within the supplemental files. Next uh, slide, please. So some of the, there are actually quite a few protocol repositories out there. The two that we're highlighting here are Protocol Exchange, which is um, uh, hosted by Nature Research, and Protocols.io. And the reason why we um, we want to highlight these ones is because they allow versioning. So you can actually make some adaptations to your protocol or someone else can, um, and that can become a separate version, but you can always go back to the original one, which not all uh, repositories allow. Um, so check out these, these places. Um, consider when you have worked hard on optimizing a method that you think other people, I mean, not even you think, you should know that when you publish your paper, there will be other scientists who want to continue working on a similar project or even in a different field, uh, try to do the same kind of um, uh, method that you have described. And they will try to go back to your uh, paper and it will be really helpful if you can actually share the exact protocol so that you can save not only them time, but they can actually um, do it in their own field and um, advance science in that way. Next slide. So just to um, give you an example of the power of repositories, um, here's this story um, of a scientist who was asking um, on Twitter if anyone had um, an RNA extraction protocol for RNA-seq um, that he could perform on primary cortical neuron cultures. Next, please. And so someone re responded to him um, pointing out uh, this protocol, this protocol that was published on protocols.io, um, and they had tried it out and it worked great for them. Next slide, please. And so when you actually follow that link, it turned out that the protocol that, um, that um, was linked here goes back to a protocol that was optimized for RNA extraction from three spine stickleback parasites. So this person would never have looked into this paper to try um, the protocol that was described here, yet still through the different fields and through optimization of the methods, other scientists had discovered that the, the method that was described here was really perfect for cortical neuronal cultures. Um, so this shows you how, how you can really um, cross the borders of different disciplines um, by sharing your protocols. Next slide, please. So just to summarize, um, sharing your protocols at repositories can really accelerate science in different ways. You can increase this, the discoverability, the reproducibility of not just your own work, but other people's work. Uh, you can facilitate research, research connections. Um, you enable reuse of not just a protocol, but everything else involved with it. And in, in some, you really just enhance the value of research. Next slide, please. So here we just want to um, take take a short break, maybe try to um, try to show you uh, the benefits of a very carefully written protocol that uh, contains all of the details that you need to really recreate um, or, or um, uh, repeat the experiment. And so I would like for you to um, take a piece of paper, take a pen, and we're going to take about five minutes or so to um, to try out this drawing exercise.
Next slide, please. So here you, you can see um, a protocol that was written up for you to be able to draw something. Uh, you don't need um, great artistic skills. <laughs> uh, you can try to just follow the steps that are described here and see if you can figure out what it is that we would like for you to, um, to draw. We'll give you about five minutes or so. If you figure it out, you can, you can just type in the chat or, or in the, the shared notes um, that you found it. Don't, don't just say what you found just yet, um, but let's see who can figure it out. And I will mute myself now. Have fun. Don't feel bad if you can't get it just to share with you. The first time I tried it, I had no clue what it was. <laughs> give everyone another minute or so. Looks like we have a first guess. Feel free if you want to, um, to snap a picture of your, your drawing and to add it into the note um, file so that we can look at everyone's attempts. Yeah, it looks like people have figured it out. Um, April, if you uh, want to go to the next slide, we can reveal that all of you have been trying to draw SpongeBob. <laughs> um, I hope you, it looks like some people were able to figure it out. Um, um, this was just an example to show you how difficult it can be to try to reproduce something just based off of text alone. Next slide, please. 
So just in case you didn't know who it was. <laughs> um, so, so when you're writing up a protocol, um, it's best if you try to think of it just as a, a document that can stand by itself, that can stand on its own, and that would be its own um, scientific publication, let's say. Um, so you want to have a three to four sentence abstract um, to start it out that just puts the methodology in context. Um, and then the next one is really important. You really want to include as much detail as possible because you may think that you will remember next month exactly which um, product that you have used and from which uh, vendor it was, what the product number was, but you won't. I can, I can guarantee you if you try to go back um, a year from now and you try to think of, oh, what was it again that I used? You will, it's likely that you will forget. Um, so write down the, the amount of time that you, you um, have to incubate every step or that, that every step takes. Um, the amount of reagent that you use, the vendor name of that reagent, even the catalog number, so that it becomes just very easy to figure out exactly what it was that you used and how long it was that every step took. Um, you can include things like expected results, the safety information, what kind of software you used, if, if that was involved in your protocol, um, the, chrono the oh, that's a tough one, chronology of steps. Um, and then this one, the next one is actually really useful for many people. What are the specific tips and tricks that you optimized that were, that really made it work? They may not necessarily be things that you would normally write down, but they are the things that, you know, you will tell your coworker if you're explaining them how to do the experiment. Don't forget to, I don't know, um, shake it twice before you, you set it into the centrifuge. There are small things that help you make it um, work that can be really crucial for the protocol. Um, and then just think about using protocols.io, Google Docs, or uh, electronic lab notebooks, like uh, the ones that April mentioned earlier, um, just to make sure that uh, they are allowing versioning so that you can keep track of any kind of changes that you make over time. Next slide, please. Um, so the next section that we're going to talk about is um, about wet lab reagent sharing. And so this is kind of continuing on the idea of open access science, where you try to really make any kind of reagent or protocol or, or um, product that you've generated through your project available to anyone who might benefit from it. Next slide, please. And so here we're going to talk about another common problem um, with science where you know you've you've generated um, a reagent that you've spent a long time optimizing and it's it's a beautiful reagent it does exactly what you need it to do uh, you publish on it and you put it away in the freezer now you move to a different lab and you know your reagent is sitting there somewhere in the freezer so now another scientist reads your publication and thinks this is great i could really use this and this could help me prove my hypothesis and they request a reagent so now the pi has to go into the freezer and go into i mean i i don't know about you but this is definitely a very common site in our freezers <laughs> reagents are are not just reagents but all kinds of um, um products are just frozen in the freezer in different boxes and it's very dif difficult to figure out exactly where the reagent is that you're looking for. Next slide, please. So just to show you how common this problem is, um, in 2005, um, there was a study performed by the NIH that found that almost half of the mouse lines that had been generated have had to be remade at least two times. So this is really a big problem and it's, it's a huge waste of resources because it's really expensive to generate mice. Um, and only 12% of the mouse lines are actually available from repositories. Um, and I can share, at least from our lab, there are, there are mouse lines that um, people have published on, but that are not publicly available and they're not willing to share. And this, it's a problem, right? Because you cannot, you cannot really validate that anything that has been shown is, is really true, or you cannot see if it's generalizable. Um, so it's really important to, um, to make sure that any reagents that you share are available to other scientists. Next slide, please. So I, I think I've, I've um, covered most of this. Um, there's, there are quite a few problems on both sides with um, having reagents not be readily available. For the researcher who is requesting the reagent, it means that they have to wait 
they can't really advance their science as fast as they would like it to. Um, and if they have to recreate the, it, the reagent themselves, there are all kinds of problems that can occur when you're trying to reproduce someone else's reagent uh, that you may not necessarily um, uh, do on purpose, let's say, but that just happens where there's a mistake um, and you actually can't just reproduce the, um, the results. For the corresponding author, um, individual labs don't always have the resources to really track the reagents and store them properly so that they can very easily go back to them, let's say five or 10 years down the line. Um, it's really challenging to authenticate the reagents that you have in the lab. So most of the times the lab will just send out the reagent without authenticating it. And they may actually be sending the wrong reagent and cause again, a huge uh, waste of time um, for everyone involved. Um, and it can be challenging to distribute all reagents to requesting researchers. Um, so um, we're going to um, um, highlight uh, several reagent repositories. Uh, so these are again, um, um, uh, small companies, often nonprofit uh, companies that um, are specialized in storing different kinds of reagents and in distributing it to different labs. Next slide, please. So um, the goal of different reagent repositories is really to make materials accessible to everyone who, uh, who wants to use them. They make sure that they do authenticate the reagents so that they know for sure when they send something out to you that it is the right thing, that it has the right quality and that you'll be able to use it. And if this is not the case, then often they will actually help you problem solve or they will send you a new reagent. Um, uh, they curate reagents, they standardize all the information that you need to be able to use it, and they also facilitate and track shipping. Next slide, please. So just, just to help you improve how to share and report on your reagents, uh, you want to record very detailed how you generated your reagent. You need to make sure that you authenticate it before you send it out. Uh, you want to provide associated publications, any kind of protocol that you use to generate it. Um, and when you name your reagent, make sure that you use very descriptive and standardized naming conventions so that it's clear to people who are using it exactly what it is that they're using. Um, something that um, is also very helpful is to try and um, generate an, an RRID for your um, reagent so that uh, this is this is going to be a number that will be linked specifically to this reagent and only this reagent so that you can include it in your publication uh, and other people can actually very easily track down what it was that you used. So um, think about depositing your reagents and, and any kind of organism that you've generated just to make it easier to do science. Next slide, please. And then here we're showing you some examples of um, uh, data repositories that are available. Uh, there are really quite a few out there. I am sure this list is not um, uh, able to cover every single one of them. There is fly base for, for fruit flies. Uh, sorry, there's the, the Bloomington Stock Center for fruit flies. There's the C. elegans Genetic Center for worms. There are, um, there's JAX for mice. There is AdGene for, uh, for plasmids. Uh, there are quite a few repositories out there. So go take a look at um, where you could either deposit your own um, data um, reagents that you generated um, or where you could actually find some that might be useful to you. Next slide, please. Awesome, thank you. Um, so now let's pivot a little bit into the code and the data side of reproducibility. Um, so I mentioned before uh, about these different types of reproducibility. Um, one type of reproducibility that people talk about a lot is computational reproducibility. And all that means is the ability to take someone's data and their code and to rerun it and to get the same tables, numbers, and figures as the original researchers. So we're going to talk a little bit about some of the tools that can help you do that. Um, for those of you that are not using um, or creating code right now, um, still keep an eye on the tools we're talking about because I think most people that are doing research now in the long run will encounter code, if not in your own lab, then at least while you're trying to understand the work of somebody else. So it is sort of helpful to have a sense of the landscape. 
Um, so again, to reiterate how common it is for people to struggle with um, reproducing uh, the results of others, um, a lot of that, uh, you know, uh, difficulty comes with reproducing your own work. And when you're talking about computational reproducibility, this often uh, manifests itself in the way where you're like coming back to code that you wrote, you know, a few months ago, or maybe even a year ago, and you try and rerun it, and you're getting errors, and you don't know why you're failing to reproduce your own results. And it can be very frustrating. Sometimes it is um, a big time waster to try and fix that and to figure out what the problem is. Sometimes it's actually impossible. You can never figure out why it didn't work. There's so many variables. So some of these tools will help to uh, lower the chances of that happening, which will make it easier for you yourself to not waste that time if you want to build on some code, um, some methods, or to reuse data that you created in the past. So one of the reasons that this is difficult to do is because um, the analysis that we're trying to rerun and reproduce um, has a lot of dependencies. Um, and dependencies is just a fancy word for any sort of file that depends on another file. So you can have a piece of code and within that code, you have a package and that's a dependency. This is another little bit of code that your code relies upon. So sometimes we um, get ourselves into this uh, terrible state of dependency hell um, is what they call it. So this is when you're trying to rerun your code and you get an error because it's missing a particular package or the package isn't the right version. So you add that package, you rerun it and you get a different error and then you go looking for that package and it becomes like a very frustrating experience. Um, the other thing that happens when you're trying to reproduce your analysis is you see it, but you don't remember why did you pick that threshold of 0.5? You don't remember why you used that package, why you did that particular test. Why did you do this? You know, when you're um, in the middle of your research and you're living and breathing it, it's hard to imagine a time where you won't just be able to remember it at the top of your head. But the truth is that we move on, we do something else, we come back and we don't remember why we made the choices that we did in our analyses. Uh, so one of the tools that I think some of you are already using from the looks of it um, is uh, literate programming. Um, and this is just an umbrella term for a way of documenting your analysis in one document. So essentially what it means is that you are um, writing out the narrative of your analysis, why you're doing this particular test, you know, uh, how it relates to your study, a little bit of written text about your analysis and the actual analysis itself together in one executable document. So you don't have your documentation stored away separately. You have this one um, piece of uh, 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 code that tells people what you did and why you did in the same document. It also makes it easy for people to play around with your analysis. So if you have a little chart that you created there, someone could go into your code within your um, piece of literate programming and play around with that threshold that you talked about, that 0.5, make it 0.3. What happens to your chart then? Make it 0.8, what, what happens then? Um, and it also, by being in one document, um, it makes it uh, easily shared. So you can create these, um, their Jupyter notebooks are a commonly used uh, form of literate programming. Our studio um, uses R Markdown with Knitter, so using the R programming language. These are both free and open source. Um, and uh, there's a strong online communities that can help you troubleshoot the errors that you will encounter as you try and get started with them. Um, but especially if you're first learning how to code, um, doing it using literal programming can be a great way to get started um, and, and to play around with you know, uh, the, uh, the documentation of your analysis while you are uh, creating it. So for those that have never heard of Jupyter Notebooks before, this is what a Jupyter Notebook looks like. Um, and it's, it's uh, this 
here. Can you guys see my cursor? I'm not sure that you can. Let me see if I can. Yeah, I can see it. You can see it? Okay, perfect. So let me turn that. Okay. So this top um, little piece here is the Jupyter Notebook. Um, and we can see up at the top, this is the narrative. So this is a little, um, you can write whatever you want so that people understand what you know, you're about to do in your analysis. And then underneath is this code chunk or code block um, that uh, is actually executable code that someone can run. And then they get you know, whatever output. It can be very simple. It can be very complicated. Um, so this is what a notebook looks like. Um, so that's a great way to sort of uh, keep a little bit of context with your analysis. Another struggle that many of us have when we come back to our own uh, code and data a few you know, weeks down the line is we don't actually remember which is the most updated version. And uh, Naila sort of touched upon this at the beginning with the idea of you know, tracking versions with uh, a really good naming convention. But another way um, and an additional way to track the changes to your files over time is to use what's called version control. If you are not a frequent programmer, like many of us are not a frequent programmer, um, this might be as simple as just finding a software such as an electronic lab notebook um, that tracks the changes automatically that you make in your files over time. So Google Drive even has version control built into it. Um, the open science framework has version control built into it. So you don't have to be a programmer to take advantage of it. But if you are um, writing some code, think about trying out Git or GitHub to, to track the changes of your code over time. And this will make it really easy when you come back to your uh, work in the future to find right away what the uh, most recent version of your code is it also tracks what changes were made um, and when and by who. So if you're collaborating with other people on code, that can really help. Um, and it allows you to actually roll back um, your code if you uh, make a mistake or feel like you went down the wrong path and you want to go back to a previous version. Uh, GitHub is just an online social uh, uh, platform that uses Git to uh, collaborate on code. So when um, I went back to my master's thesis uh, a year later um, to rerun, I was making like a bunch of maps um, because I'm an epi, uh, an epidemiologist, I found that I could not get my code to run. And it turned out that the uh, issue had to do with some of the software packages that I had used. Um, some of the dependencies had changed, um, some of the versions of the dependencies that I use actually cause the code to break. Um, so let's talk a little bit about some tools that can help keep your code running in the long run. Um, so using a package manager, also known as a dependency manager or managing environments, these are new terms for some of you, um, but in general, this is just about managing all of those different files that your analysis relies upon so that you can keep that code working you know, um, into the future. So uh, Conda is an excellent example of a dependency manager to get started with. It works for a lot of different languages. And the reason that Conda is something we recommend for reproducibility is because they actually will, um, you know, when they update a version of a package, so say you used package 1.0, and then there was a new version that's 1.1 was released, they actually check to make sure that 1.1 doesn't break any of the code that 1.0 worked with. So they're making sure that you uh, can avoid as much as possible um, your code breaking. Um, so uh, another way of ensuring that you're documenting you know, your analysis in a way that's reproducible is to document your environment. So we're not gonna be able to go into all of the nitty gritty of what this means, but just something to keep in your radar if you are starting to use code is that you want 
these particular files to accompany your code. And these are files that will document the dependencies that your code is relying upon. Uh, environment.yaml is one common one that people use in Python. Requirements.txt, another one you'll see people often using with Python code. If you're using R, you can use CRAN and R projects to manage your environments and your dependencies. And you can document your packages in a file such as install.r. These are just some examples. What you want to just make sure you do is that you're tracking all the dependencies your code is relying upon somewhere and that you're trying to keep that up to date. Um, so uh, there's a new, relatively new technology the last maybe 10 years um, uh, called containers. Um, and containers can really help with computational reproducibility. We, again, don't have time to go into the technical details of this, but something to have on your radar if you are um, dealing a lot with code and you're going to run into some problems with reproducibility. What it allows you to do is sort of package up all your dependencies, absolutely everything, into what they call an image. Um, and you uh, are creating um, that little piece of documentation that we talked about before in the form of a Docker file. Um, so uh, this just allows you to sort of share your code with all the software, hardware, all the dependencies in one place. It's sort of like passing somebody a computer that has your compute that has your code running on it. And they don't need to install anything to get your code to run again. If you are an infrequent programmer, then the thing to look for is to look for um, uh, platforms that have Docker baked into them so that you don't have to learn how to actually run Docker yourself because it might be too difficult to do. But you can have it on your radar that if you see a platform that will help you um, to manage and share your analysis that has Docker built into it, we'll talk about one in a minute, um, that can really help improve the computational reproducibility of your work. Um, so the tool that I recommend for people that are getting started with containers and getting started with trying to automatically um, share these environments is called Binder. And Binder has come out of the Jupyter world. So we talked about literal programming and Jupyter notebooks. This is the same group of people that have built this. So it is really useful for people that are creating Jupyter notebooks and want to share them in a way that allows their computational environment that allows their analysis to run to be shared alongside it. Um, so take a look at that if you want to get started. All you need to do is have um, a GitHub repo with all your code in it. And one of those uh, standard files that I mentioned, such as install.r or requirements.txt in the repository that has all your dependencies listed. And it will automatically rebuild that environment and give you a little link that you can share with anyone you want. And they can play around with your work without installing anything. Um, so if you have questions for that, I know it's a little high level for some of you that are not programming a lot. But if um, you have an idea that these things exist, then when you do start to try out coding a little bit for yourself, you'll have a little sense of the landscape. So um, most people nowadays will have either data or code that is related to uh, their work. So how do you best share that information? Um, so first, uh, we want to think about what is important to share. Um, we want to be sure that we share any data or code that's necessary for someone else to validate and reproduce our results. So if you're sharing a paper and it has a lot of figures in it and you have some claims in it, you want to make sure that someone is able to rerun your data and code and actually reproduce those images, those tables, and those um, claims that you have in your paper. Also share anything that you think could be useful for anyone else. So if you've come up with some code and it's really helped you out in your lab, think about sharing that because it will probably be useful to somebody else. Um, also share anything that's rare or not easily regenerated. Um, so that we're not remaking the wheel and we're all using your resources, you know, in the best way for science. Um, some funders and publishers are now mandating sharing. So for some of you, that's going to be why you try it out for the first time. 
Um, there is some evidence that sharing your data actually can give you a boost in um, the citations that you get. That's maybe causal, it might just be a correlation, but it can't hurt. Um, sharing your data into a, um, a repository that preserves it over time also will preserve long-term access to your data. And this is something that um, people don't think about until it's too late oftentimes. Um, you, you know, uh, create data with your lab and then, you know, five years later, everyone's moved on to different positions and you can't find it anymore. The person who had it isn't reachable. They can't find the, um, where it was stored. Uh, if you deposit it into a repository, then you will always have access to your own data. Um, so in general, when you're thinking about sharing, as much as possible, choose open formats, use non-proprietary formats. So this allows other people to reuse your data without having to buy a license. And it also ensures that if that company that creates that proprietary format goes out of business, becomes obsolete, that people can continue to reuse it. Um, make sure you share documentation that enables reuse. One of the questions we have in our shared notes document is what is a readme? That's an example of some documentation that can enable reuse. So a readme will give context to your data and code when you share it in a repository. Um, cite any of the data that you have reused, so the source data, and um, create some rich metadata. Some of the repositories will actually prompt you with metadata fields. Um, so that's um, one way to uh, uh, make sure that you're including the metadata that people expect. Um, when you're sharing your data, make sure you're not just sharing it um, from a website or just a straight up URL to some, you know, uh, site managed by you or your university. Um, and that's because those links decay over time. You post it, it's live. A few years later, it's going to break. Um, so instead, what you want to do is pick a data repository. The benefits are they give you a persistent identifier. And this allows that link rot to not happen. This identifier will last for years, as long as that repository is managed. And many of these repositories have very rigorous plans for staying stable over time. It allows persistent access. It preserves your data over time and your code. Um, Many of them will have a, a backup option. So you're ensuring that you're not going to lose it if uh, something happens um, to the platform. Many of them allow for versioning. So if you are working on a, a data set over time, you can update it and people can see the two different versions and you can mark the version that is related to particular publications. And finally, it allows you to pick a license and signal to other people how they are allowed to reuse your data. Um, so we won't go into the details of these licenses right now because we're sort of uh, running out of time, which is common for me. Um, but just know that you should always be picking a data license when you share your data and you should always be picking a code license for your code. These licenses will be different and they should be different. And there are lots of tools out there to help you pick one that's appropriate for the type of data and code that you're sharing. Um, so if you are trying to pick a repository for the first time, the first things to think through is, am I required to post it somewhere? That's a mandated repository. That can be from the funder or the institution. The second thing to think about is, where are the people in my discipline looking for data and code? That's a discipline-specific repository, and that is a good choice because that means the metadata will relate to the type of data you're probably collecting and also your colleagues will be looking for the data there. Um, otherwise, there are general purpose repositories that you can use. These are just a few examples here. Uh, Zenodo is an excellent one, especially if you are sharing data and code, because Zenodo actually has an integration with GitHub um, that allows you to release your code and your data from Zenodo. Um, so finally, there's this idea called the FAIR principles, FAIR data principles. Um, and this is sort of a goalpost of making sure that when you share your data, that it's findable, that it's accessible, that it's interoperable. So you're using standards so that other people can pool the data with other data sets. 
and then it's reusable. So you pick a license that allows other people to build upon your work and to accelerate research. As we said, that's the goal of all of this. Sorry, Nela, I took up a lot of your time. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know if people um, can stay on a bit longer. I'll, I'll try to fit everything within the next 10 minutes. Uh, but should you have any questions, please feel free to stay on and, and we can talk about them. Um, so the next section that we're going to cover, oh, sorry, I forgot that to turn on my video. There we go. Um, the next section we're going to talk about is data vis visualization. And I have a very hard time with pronouncing that word. So I'm just going to call it data viz. Um, April, if you want to go to the next slide. Actually, the next one after this. So the reason why we're covering this section in the workshop here is because the way that we choose to present our data in our papers really represents how people will remember it. If you think back about you know, the, the last paper that you read um, and you try to remember what was it exactly that they were showing, typically what comes to mind is that, that key figure that really drove the message home and that showed you exactly that their hypothesis was right. Um, and here it's, it's really the way that, you, that you've chosen to show your data that will um, drive this message home. And you want to make sure, especially because at this moment, it's not, um, not common yet for, for us to deposit all of our raw data that was linked to our experiments and our projects. Um, you really want to think about being as transparent as possible with how you show your data, just to make sure that people down the line can critically evaluate um, the data that you obtain. Next slide, please. So when you're, when you're thinking about creative, creating effective figures, you want to make sure that they um, convey information about your study design in just a wink of an eye. Um, they want to illustrate or they have to illustrate important findings. But importantly, they also should allow the reader to critically evaluate the data. Um, so really make sure that you show your data so someone else can look, look at it. Um, and this is typically one that we tend to forget. Next slide, please. So thinking about where you start, um, you have to make sure that you analyze your data in um, a reproducible way. And so depending on which platform you use, there are different ones out there. The majority of us use Excel, but there are many different out there. And it doesn't really matter which one you use. You want to make sure that you have reproducible workflows so that some, when, one, when somebody else comes in and takes over your project, they can just look at the way that you've organized your data, the way that you've analyzed it, and they can take it from there. It's clear how you work through it. Um, one thing to keep in mind is that Excel tends to rename genes. So take a look at the paper that's linked here. Um, it shows you which kind of genes tend to be renamed to, for instance, um, dates, um, like NOV1, for instance. Uh, and there was a, uh, this paper shows that um, uh, about 20% of the papers that are containing, you know, large data sets and gene lists actually have errors in the way of their gene naming. Um, and then a problem that we're going to talk about a little bit about in the next section um, is um, how the vast majority of papers are using uh, bar charts and line uh, plots to show their data. And I'll show you why that's not the optimal way to show you uh, your data. Next slide, please. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time on this slide because I think it really drives the, the message home. Um, what you're seeing here is um, a bar graph on uh, the left in panel A um, and all different kinds of data distributions in the other panels that can lead to the identical graph that you see in um, panel A. Um, so in panel B, for instance, you see um, two different data sets, two different groups that um, um, where group B for, uh, or the second group um, looks like the mean might actually be a little bit higher than in the, the first group. So that might be a difference that you uh, might want to continue studying. But if you look further in panel C, for instance, uh, when you are able to actually see the data itself, you can see that there's a data point that seems to be an outlier. Um, whether something happened to this sample or if this is a real outlier, um, you might want to think about. Uh, but it does um, uh, mean that, for instance, if you look at the actual um, average of the, the data points that are below there, they look much closer to the average of group one. So there might actually not be a real difference there. Um, in panel D, you can see that the data is bimodally distributed. So there might actually be a confounding factor that underlies this difference here. Like for instance, 
the different sex might have an effect on whether your values um, are lower or higher here. Um, and then in the last panel, um, you can see that there are actually um, different number of samples in the two different groups. So you might not be uh, representing the variability of your um, data set properly in the second group, and this might change uh, the outcome of your analysis. And so you can see that, especially below, um, that if you cannot distinguish between any of these scenarios based on just the statistics alone. So it's really important to be able to show the actual data so someone can go in later. And these are showing you the extremes, right? Um, um, your data might not look anything like this and might look more like panel B, which is what you would like for it to be. But somewhere down the line, let's say maybe 5, 10, 20 years down the line, a scientist may read your paper and may actually notice something that you didn't notice because now there's 10 years extra um, uh, advance in science that may have shown different ideas, different advances um, that put your data in a different spotlight. So if you're able to show your actual data, um, people can go back to it and can continue to analyze it further. Next slide, please. Just to drive this message home a little bit further, um, what we're going to try to show here, I don't know if the, the image is going to run, um, what you're going to see is all kinds of different patterns that can be generated with the exact same summary statistics. So on the right, you can see the summary statistics. On the left, you can see that, I mean, there are many different data distributions that can be generated to, to um, produce these summary statistics, but that really doesn't mean that they're all as trustworthy if you were to see them in a paper. <laughs> so it's very important to show the data. Next slide, please. Um, this one, um, maybe I'll skip this slide because it, um, I think I've mentioned most of it in the previous one. What I want to spend some time on is um, for you to be able to choose the right plot to best show your data. So if you've run a small scale pilot experiment, for instance, you have, let's say, six or, or seven um, uh, samples per group, uh, you might want to show them as a dot plot. Um, you have continuous data, meaning you can have any kind of value um, between uh, let's say two and eight, for instance, um, you have a small sample size and it doesn't matter which data distribution, you'll be able to look at the individual data points um, as well as the mean or the median. Let's say now you've shown this data to your, your PI and he thinks oh, there might actually be a difference between group one and group two, but I'm not entirely convinced. I want you to repeat this, this experiment a couple more times. Now you find yourself with a medium uh, sample size. And then it becomes better to show your data as a box plot so that you can see the summary statistics, but you can still see the individual points. If you are working with a larger data set, um, you can choose between a box plot or a violin plot. Personally, I, I prefer the violin plot because it, it does show the distribution of your data. So the wider, the wider your graph is here, um, the more data points are, um, um, sorry, I'm blanking on the word here, I showed that exact value. Um, so here, the violin plot could, for instance, still reveal whether you have bimodal distribution, whereas in a box plot, you would not be able to see that. And then finally, when would it be okay to use a bar graph? Bar graphs are really mostly meant for um, a categorical data when you just have specific counts, like it's either one or it's two, um, then you can show a bar graph. But when you have continuous data, um, you should, um, opt for other options. Next slide, please. So how, how can you make your uh, dot plots the most effective? I'll try to not spend too much time, but, but you want to make sure that you can see the individual data points. And you can do this in different ways. You can decrease your point size. You can try to make them semi-transparent. Or if you have a larger data set, you can uh, think about jittering your data points so that they are spread out um, along the axis more. Next slide. And then you also want to just make sure that you make optimal use of the space that you have. So in panel F, for instance, you can see a graph that is quite difficult to interpret and it will take you a bit of time to, to see that uh, group three may actually be higher compared to the other groups. Um, so um, you can make this graph better by increasing the width. 
um, in panel G, that it becomes more clear what the different groups are. And um, something that's very helpful is actually to just emphasize the summary statistics and make the, the actual data points semi-transparent so that you can still see them if you want to. But the key uh, point that uh, jumps out is what the difference in the mean is between the different groups. Next slide, please. So there are different ways that you can that you can generate your your plots. Um, shown here are some options to actually generate interactive plots, so that people can go into um, into your graph itself and can play around with the data themselves. Um, if you don't want to use those, next slide. There are several um, other options as well, um, and so we're just showing you uh, some over here. I tend to use Prism. I like it a lot, um, but it's not open access and there is a license. Um, so it, there, there are choices that you have to make whether you know you can afford to, to choose them, but there are definitely some um, open access tools out there as well. Next slide, please. So um, we hope that, you've, that we've been able to um, um, share some um, ideas with you that you might find useful that can help you to organize your experiments, um, to accurately analyze your results, to make sure that you are able to share them with other scientists in a way that they can use them in the future, um, and just in general that we are able to together uh, accelerate science. Next slide. So this is one thing that you, you can think about. What is one thing that you learned today um, that you could incorporate in your workflow to make your research more reproducible? And feel free to share it in the chat, in the notes, um, or just open up your mic if you have any questions. Um, I think we're going to, in the next slide, just thank our sponsors. Um, uh, as April men mentioned in the beginning, we've been lucky to be uh, supported by uh, different companies um, in uh, making this workshop available and making it freely available to everyone. Um, in the next slide, you'll you'll find that all of the material that we've shared with you is um, available under um, the CC BY4 license so that you actually are able to um, reuse it yourself. You can modify it. Um, they are available at our website. They're also available through uh, the links that we shared with you um, in the beginning. And so I want to say thank you to all of you. If you want to um, add us on Twitter, you want to reach out to us, you, uh, you think you want to get involved, we are more than happy to, um, to have you join us. Um, just feel free to reach out. And if you have any questions, um, open up your mic or put them in the, in the chat or in the notes. And thanks for coming. <laughs>